Well, we're going to continue uh, the series begun several weeks ago in Colossians as we move uh, step by step through this marvelous, rich uh, message of the gospel. Colossians chapter 1, the preaching verse today is the uh, 23rd, but we're going to read a little bit more broadly just to get the context backing up to where we were last time we were together. That is in verse uh, 21. So I'll read Colossians chapter 1, beginning in the 21st verse through the 23rd. Let me remind you that this is the Word of God, which is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It is that which penetrates, even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is that which judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So give attention to God's Word. Once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Let's pray. Father, we pray again in gratitude for your word. Thank you for its sufficiency for all the needs of our lives, matters of faith, matters of day-to-day living. And yet sometimes we have trouble hearing And other times we have trouble believing. And other times we have trouble applying. So we pray that by your spirit in these moments you would overcome those troubles and help us to hear and to believe and to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It's often been said that half a truth is a whole lie. And that applies even to the Word of God when it is misused. Bible verses taken out of context or Bible verses isolated from a clarifying context that can explain them and help help us understand the fullness of their meaning can function in our lives as half-truths and therefore as whole lies. Whether that happens by someone's malicious intent, uh, the devil himself, misusing scripture as he tried to do with the Lord Jesus, or more innocently as it comes through the ignorance of someone who may be well-meaning but just misguided and a careless reader. The word of God can be delivered to us as a half-truth and therefore a full lie. But to keep us from falling into this error, Colossians 1.23 gives us the whole truth This verse qualifies what we had already considered, what we had just read in verses 21 and 22. In a certain sense, it corrects what we read there. So what did we learn from those verses? We learned that in spite of our miserable before, the before of our sinful beginnings, because of which we were alienated from God, because of which we were actually an enemy of God, we now have been reconciled to him through Christ, and in our glorious after, We're able, therefore, to stand before him in holiness, without blemish, and free from accusation. That is the truth. But that's not the whole truth. The whole truth includes the if of verse 23. You're reconciled to God, holy in his sight, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out, in the gospel. That's the whole truth of God's word to us. Perhaps you remember the Sermon on the Mount. When the Lord Jesus had finished all that wonderful teaching, he said that there were two kinds of people listening to him there that day. Not that day, but every day. This day, even here in this place. First of all, he said there are those who hear his words and put them into practice. 
That is, those who embrace his word with a true and living faith and then give to him the obedience which he deserves. Type one. And then there are others, type two, who hear his words but do not put them into practice. They give no particular importance to those words. They put little or no stock in the truth of the message, and therefore they make very little effort to obey. So these people are lips-only believers, lips-only professions of faith, not having any internal change uh, at all. And then Jesus tells them this wonderful little story to illustrate the difference between these two kinds of hearers. He says that the people who hear and obey his words are like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rains came down and the floods came up and the winds blew and beat against his house, it did not fall because the foundation of that house was on the rock. But then by contrast, Jesus said that those who hear his words and do not put them into practice or like the foolish man who built his house on what? On the sand, right? And the rains came down and the streams rose up and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Now that's a, a great little story. But it's so much more than just a little story because it conveys to us enormously important truth. It tells us, first of all, that to be truly saved, it is not enough just to call upon the name of the Lord. Say, Jesus, Lord, Lord, giving lip service only to his teachings, but without any follow-up, without any obedience to those teachings. Those in that category will fall sooner or later. In some way or another, they'll come down, and they'll come down with a terrible crash at that. This parable teaches us, secondly, something else that's very important. It's not enough just to begin with Jesus. We must travel with him all the way. A true follower of Jesus perseveres. Perseveres to the end. And in Jesus' story, we see the reason for the perseverance of some and the reason for the failure of others. Those who are established on the rock they're the ones who stand firm. Those are the ones who are able to withstand the storms that the devil and the world inevitably hurl against us. But those who are built on the sand, that is not really grounded, not really grounded, not established, not firmly placed, then they're the ones who falter. They're the ones who are flattened. They're the ones who fall, even when the first winds of opposition begin to blow. So it's all about whether one is truly established, truly grounded, truly stable. And all of this is bound up in the teaching we have from the Apostle in Colossians 1.23 this morning. What does it mean then to be established? Well, of course, faith is the key. Faith is the key. Faith is the means by which we lay hold of the good things that God promises to us in Jesus Christ. The means by which we lay hold of the good things that God has promised to us in his Son. You know how it is. God's law condemns us. Not because the law is bad, but because the law shows that I am bad. The law says, love your neighbor as yourself. I'm not sure I have ever really done that. Down to the bottom of it. In completeness. I'm not sure I've ever done that. Does that mean it's a bad law? No, it doesn't mean it's a bad law at all. I can see the law is good. That's the right thing to do. That's as it should be. But it means that when I hold myself up to the law and take measure of my obedience to the law, I see plainly how big a failure I am. The law says that I must obey him perfectly to receive the good things that he has stored up for me. Do this and you will live. That's what his word says. The problem is I, I cannot do it. I cannot keep God's law. And neither can you. And friends, that brings us, you and me, face to face with some very bad news. Because the Bible says, curse it. 
cursed is the man who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out and that means all these words the slightest departure from god's law brings us under his curse brings us under his condemnation and that brings why i am so grateful for the gospel this morning the gospel we've reviewed the gospel that we've sung the gospel that we've mentioned in prayer that's why the gospel is such good news, because the gospel tells me I can receive these good things of God, these things I would never receive through law-keeping. I can receive these good things through faith, faith alone, in Christ alone. Faith is the key. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him, whosoever will not perish but have everlasting life. For by grace are you saved through faith. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, he who believes has everlasting life. Good things, good things all through. Faith is the key to all these good things of God. And Jesus has done a wondrously beautiful thing by coming to us as our Savior, by keeping God's law perfectly on our behalf, and then by dying as a sacrifice for us. So a just God is therefore able to forgive all of our sins and give us eternal life because Christ has paid for our many sins and he has earned heaven for us by his perfect obedience. But none of that comes to us unless and until it is received by faith. Faith is the key. What kind of faith? So here's the central question. The theological question of this sermon, what is the true nature of faith? Or what is the nature of true faith? Saving faith is that faith which is built to last. That doesn't apply to some brands of pickup truck. <laughs> built to last. Faith that's saving and true is built to last. Jesus said, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And so if it's going to save, faith must endure. Over in Stanley at First Pres, where I pastored for all those decades, uh, we had a major outreach emphasis through our sports ministry, our youth sports ministry. And one of the principles that we established in that sports ministry was that um, Every player got a trophy. I know that's condemned and sneered at in some areas, but we weren't trying to raise all-star athletes. We were trying to raise Christians. And so if you played, you got a trophy. Or in the later, latter years, some of the older kids didn't much care for the trophy, so we started giving them T-shirts, you know. They didn't have to be a star athlete to get a trophy, but they did have to do something. They had to finish the season. They dropped out. They quit before it was over. No trophy. That's how it is uh, with faith. Faith that truly saves must persevere to the end. So now it seems that we're able to identify two kinds of people who sadly will miss all these good things that God has stored up for us in Christ, who will be excluded from the salvation that Christ has purchased for his people. First, there are the unbelievers, those who have no faith, those who actually reject the promises of God through unbelief, Mark 16, 16, whoever does not believe will be condemned. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. But the unbelieving ones are not the only ones excluded. Also missing out on salvation are those who start out with some form of faith in the beginning but quit along the way. Think about another of Jesus' brilliant little stories, the story of the sower uh, and the seed. He scattered lots of seeds, which was the word of God, and most of the seed came up. Only that which fell upon the path where the birds came and ate it before it could sprout did not uh, germinate, did not come up. That was probably about a quarter of the seed. Three quarters of the seed began to grow. But then the sun beat down and the seed on the soil, because it was thin, couldn't get a good hold. It had no root. It withered and it dried up. And then the briars and the weeds began to grow in another area. 
And the seed that was sown there in the briars and the weeds, well, that was choked out by the bad stuff. The good stuff came to nothing. Only the seed that was received in the good soil went on to mature and to make a crop. So four kinds of soil. Seed, which began to grow in three kinds of soil, but in only one kind was there any harvest. So, what shall we conclude? It's not enough just to make a beginning. It's not enough just to have some sort of faith. It has to be the right kind of faith. And the right kind of faith is that faith which endures. Now, it's possible, of course, that someone with this, what shall we call it, shadow faith, this wrong kind of faith, this weak imitation of faith that consists of an empty profession and maybe even some emotion, it's possible that someone like that may become a member of the church and stay a member of that church until they die. It's possible. Usually, something will come along, some hardship, some temptation, to strip off the mask and show the world what they truly are. But if they're never severely tested, if they're never really greatly tempted, it's possible to remain mixed in with the true believers right along through life, even though all they have is this shadow faith, not real faith, untested untempted like a virtuous woman who's able to stay virtuous because she was never asked out on a date by a handsome rogue but those were the mere shallow faith will certainly not be saved by such imitation because God knows God knows he sees he understands the truth Jesus spoke of those who would speak to him on Judgment Day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? But to whom he would reply, I never knew you. Away with you, you evildoers. The apostle, therefore, is, is, is showing us here that he's talking about enduring faith, not this shadow faith, but true faith. And he says, if you continue in your faith, and he adds, established and firm. This is the real deal. Faith that endures. Established and firm. The apostle is saying that for us to receive forgiveness and eternal life, we must have faith which perseveres. Which perseveres not simply because it's untried, not simply because it's untested, but which perseveres because it actually is. It actually is stable and steadfast, grounded and firm. The first word that the NIV translates here, established, is used of buildings. It's used of those buildings that are set down deep into the earth, deep excavation, down to solid rock, and therefore they're firmly, solidly grounded. This is the same word that Jesus used in his parable about what? About the two houses that we mentioned earlier. The house on rock, the house on on sand, the house left standing was founded on the rock. It was established down deep. The second word, firm, has just a slight shade of difference in its meaning. It doesn't refer to the reason something is stable. Established refers to the reason it's on the rock. This does not refer to the reason that something is stable, such as a building on a deep foundation, but just to the fact that it is stable. Or something, or someone is difficult to move because for whatever reason, regardless of the reason, it is fixed in its place. It is firm and unshakable. It's used for a man who has settled something in his mind, has his own mind settled, and therefore is unmovable. He's not easily swayed. Established and firm. That's the settled condition of true believers, those who will ultimately be saved. Their faith is grounded on the eternal rock, Jesus Christ their Lord, and being seated and established there, it cannot be shaken. So what we're seeing is, now, there's more than one kind of faith. And it is oh so important to have the right one. 
And this is one reason why hard times in this life can really be a blessing from God. If we can go through times of trial, if we can pass through times of testing and come out the other end with our faith intact, we are encouraged. We are reassured that it's the real thing. The Apostle Peter wrote about such trials. He says, these trials have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So don't despise the hard things of the Lord. Don't despise the trials and testings which the Lord may allow or present into your life. Look for God's good in those things. And part of the good may be your own reassurance as to the genuineness of your faith. There is a faith which is insincere, which is false. Beware of such faith. But how blessed we are to know there is also a faith which is established and firm. When our faith is founded on the merits, on the death, on the intercession of the Lord Jesus Christ, it can never fail because he will never fail. It's on him. So what did we sing? This, in other words, that the true Christian perseveres to the end, gives no credit to the Christian, but all credit to the Christ, who is the Christian's sure foundation. So the faith that we're looking for, the faith that's real, which perseveres, as our verse goes on to say, is faith that is tied to hope. And so we are to continue in that faith, not moved from our hope. And although we have to examine our faith to make sure it's real, and that is troublesome, disturbing sometimes, and although sometimes trials and testings may be used by God, by God to show us whether it's genuine or not, and that can be painful, God does not want us to despair. He wants us always to be full of hope. The Bible says that hope is the believer's anchor, and God would not have us severed from that anchor to be set adrift in some restless sea of unending doubt. And so the apostle reminds us that our faith and our hope are established in the gospel. Where do you look for your hope? What is the source of the hope that you have? Any hope we may try, try to draw from any other source besides Jesus, besides the gospel of Christ, is useless. It is empty. The only real hope is the hope that embraces the promises of Jesus Christ. That is a solid hope, a solid source of hope. These are the promises of the gospel. The gospel promises us, first of all, all the complete cleansing from our sin, peace with God in Jesus Christ, from knowing that sin no longer separates us from God anymore. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been reconciled. But it's only if you are in Christ. Those who try to remedy their own sins, who try to work them off, as one might try to work off a debt, or who try to deny that they're really much to be concerned about, there's really not much consequence to them, they're really not so bad, they could just be easily overlooked. That is to carry oneself away from the gospel. And if what I said earlier was true, that the gospel is the source of our only hope, it is to carry them away from the only hope that there is. Because to come to Christ, one must turn from sin. And you do not turn from sin which you have minimized or which you have denied or that you've been imagining that you could do something uh, to erase. Sinners need a real Savior. And Jesus is the only real Savior. The reality of sin and the reality of need for cleansing. And then the gospel promises us eternal life in heaven by the grace of God in his Son. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. 
for my father's will is that everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life and i will raise him up at the last day but again the centrality of jesus christ is decisive so look for your well-being whether in heaven or whether on earth to look for your well-being in anything other than your relationship with the lord jesus christ is to abandon gospel hope, to minimize its potency and power available for your life. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. I am the way and the truth and the life, Jesus says, and apart from me, you can do nothing. So who establishes you? Who establishes you? And of course you must be established. You must be established because Satan will come against you, attack your faith, try to knock it out from under you. He'll come. But then there are also the temptations of this life, so shiny, so sparkly, that they're going to come and try to lure you away from your faith. That's when you must turn your ear and your heart to the voice of Scripture that calls out to you, continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. It is this hope, this belief in the gospel in which we must stand firm. This is the faith to which the promises of God are made, promises of peace, promises of forgiveness, promises of eternal life. God says it right here that he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Jesus Christ establishes you through his gospel. And if you have this gospel, you may certainly assure yourself and be assured by God's own word that by holding on to it, standing firm upon it, continuing in it, you will know peace and you will know the salvation of Jesus Christ. And that's the whole truth. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the completeness of your provision in Christ. Thank you that there's nothing left for us to do except to believe. Because there's nothing that we could do. And even the belief, the faith, even that is a gift from your hand. And so we're humbled. To recognize how far from you we were, how completely alienated, and how thoroughly enemies, but to stand in awe of what you've done for us. We praise you for the gospel, and we beg you for that gift of persevering in the faith so that we who persevere to the end may be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, this matter of perseverance is a grace of God. 